Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session, International Channels, Planting the Flag and Building the Brand. Here is our moderator, Editor TBI, Stuart Clark. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so without further ado, let's get straight on because I think we've got a lot to get through. I'll just introduce the panelists very quickly. To my immediate right, we have Simon Sutton. He's president of HBO International and content distribution at HBO. Next to Simon is Dee Forbes, who is EVP and MD, Discovery Networks UK and Western Europe. Next, we have Andy Kaplan, who is President Networks, Sony Pictures Television. Next to Andy, we have Roma. This is a big title, Roma. We have President of Universal Networks International and Digital <coughs> Initiatives at Universal Networks. And at the end of the row, we have, we have Hernan Lopez, President and CEO of Fox International Channels. Um, first, and, and by way of a, a slightly deeper introduction, perhaps we could just run down the panel um, and each panelist could just very briefly outline the, the channels group for which they're responsible in terms of uh, geographical presence and so forth, and perhaps give us a sense of what it is that makes that group unique and, and distinguishes it from, from the competition of which, of course, there is, there is much. So, Simon, with, with HBO, just... Certainly. Well, obviously, HBO is a premium channel provider. We generally provide two brands around the world, HBO and Cinemax. We operate international channels in Latin America and Brazil, Central and Eastern Europe, India and Asia. I'm also responsible for our worldwide home entertainment, which is DVD sales and uh, iTunes type downloading, and uh, syndication, whether it be selling our TV shows to other TV networks in the US or to TV networks outside the US. Thank you, Dee. Okay. Um, well, Discovery Networks um, is a worldwide um, you know, group, of, group of networks, internationally operating for 21 years now, um, with Discovery obviously being the flagship. Um, the number one non-fiction company is how we refer to ourselves across the world. Not only that, we've also um, really developed along the lines of lifestyle entertainment, and TLC is a brand that we're now launching internationally across this year and began last year. Discovery really is all about great content, storytelling, and bringing characters to life. Um, and really, I think where, where I'm coming in is I look after Western Europe and the UK, so that is the mature markets within the European context, which covers France, Italy, Spain, Benelux, the Nordic. So very, very mature markets at a very similar state of development. Thanks, Dee. Uh, Andy. Uh, Sony Pictures Television Networks Group is a, is a worldwide group. Most of our activity and assets is outside of the United States. We're uh, pretty much established in, in every region of the world. We have predominantly three brands, uh, Sony Entertainment Television, AXN, and Animax, um, again, in most territories uh, in the world, highlighting the, the best of US and other um, general entertainment programming. And I think we're also a little bit uniquely suited relative to some of the others in that we have a very big presence in India with our Sony Entertainment Television channel and associated networks uh, there. Thanks. Roma? So I oversee Universal <coughs> Networks International, that's NBC Universal's global network, entertainment network business, so that's out of the United States, and like uh, some of my friends here, we have uh, channels in most territories in the world. We have a revitalized brand portfolio under core entertainment brands, so Universal Channel, Sci-Fi Universal, 13th Street Universal, Diva Universal, and Studio Universal, and the way we position ourselves is that we want to be top rated entertainment channels, primarily drifted by, uh, driven by scripted television in every market that we work in around the world. And I think what another differentiator is we're one of the newer players to the game in terms of growing our business internationally. And uh, at Fox International Channels, we operate 200 television channels under online and related production units around the world under two main buckets of content, entertainment and factual, and each of those are primarily under the Fox and National Geographic brands. And I think the one thing that makes us more distinct is that we have a very globally diversified portfolio with stakes in both premium and basic. And we have the most, I believe, local presence in, in the group. We have 51 offices um, and 2,500 employees all around the world, the majority of them outside of the US. Great, thanks. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that, that we've endured some, uh, some very turbulent economic times. Uh, and I know the received wisdom is that pay TV subscriptions are very resilient during such times. Um, however, of course, advertising revenues also take a hit. 
Um, it'd be great to get some thoughts as to the impact for the international pay TV channels of the recession or, or, or downturn, and perhaps um, whether that affected the balance of affiliates and ad revenues. Um, maybe start the other end. Her Hernan, perhaps to you first. It affected it slightly. Our uh, affiliate revenues continue to grow through the recession, even as our advertising revenues on a worldwide basis declined a little bit, but they, they started to pick up very, recent, very shortly after the end of the recession. And today, we're roughly where we were before the recession started in, in two-thirds of our revenue coming from affiliate sales. Roma, is that, is that, have you had a similar experience? It's very similar, but I, I would break it down between emerging markets and mature markets. In mature markets, especially mature advertising markets, I think they were hit from the advertising dollar perspective uh, heavier than emerging markets. Emerging markets continued to see growth um, with advertising sales, but where we saw a slowdown was in a lot of these markets where there are new platforms coming up and very um, fragmented platforms, so DTH and cable platforms, a lot of those businesses slowed down in launches of new capacity. So if they were going to put a new satellite in the air, they might have delayed that for a year and only now are getting back to that. So the capacity didn't grow in the same way we were hoping it would grow. So we saw a slowdown in 2009 and happy to say it, it feels like it's picking up again. Uh, Andy, Sony's got channels of the world over. I wonder what your experience was in, through, through the recessionary period in terms of ad revenues and affiliate fees. Did, did the mix change? Well, we, we sort of had the same experience. I mean, the great news about, for most of us, having dual revenue stream businesses is, you know, you have a, a sort of natural hedge against, uh, you know, tough economic times. So, yeah, we, we also got hit on the advertising side, but I don't think we got hit nearly as badly as the over-the-air broadcasters who, who had, you know, a bigger pie to get hit with and, and, uh, and so much more exposure. And on the, on the uh, affiliate side, it seemed like in recessionary times, people were staying home more, and the last thing they were going to do was flip off their cable subscription. And so, it, at worst, things were stable, and I think in a lot of cases, there was a, actually growth there to fill in the gap. Is it your sense, Andy, that, that uh, on the advertising side, that those revenues kind of w will come back? Or was there, a, was there kind of a cyclical change where affiliate revenues kind of took on more importance because of the downturn? Uh, I, I think the advertising, you know, as, as Renan said, it has, has come back. It's, it's two years now, and so we, we took a dip. It wasn't as, as extreme, and, and things have, have crawled back, and affiliate has started to go up. The mix is different, as Roma said. Merging market mix is going to be different than the mature market mix, but, you know, on, on balance, uh, I think the, uh, the natural hedge of dual revenue stream really benefited our business. And, and then, Dee, you, um, the channels for which you're responsible are, are in some of the most mature markets. Um, I, I wonder what your experience was. Um, very, very similar to the rest of the panel, really, where, again, I think the, the value of a dual stream really comes, comes through in a recession because you know pretty much on the affiliate side that your revenues are fixed, so you have to then look where your gaps may be and look at the efficiencies that can be driven around that. So I think, yes, while we, we certainly had, um, we, we saw some downtown in 09, that has come back in 10, a very, very strong year this year. Um, and I think, you know, what, what's been, I think, very important for us is the strength of the brand. Um, advertisers in a recession will, will work with brands that mean something and have a value for their, for their brands. So in terms of sponsorship promotions, we've seen a, a really good, um, good year there. And I think, again, it's the brand strength and the, the strength of the programming that comes through in that, in that environment. And Simon, obviously, HBO uh, being a, a premium network, uh, what, does, does that mean that the experience was slightly different in terms of uh, the, the impact of the downturn? I think so. I'm just going to tell an anecdote from friends in other industries. Apparently, in the recession, ketchup sales went up massively, uh, and our ratings went up as well. So I think in the US, people were staying home, eating ketchup, and watching HBO. <coughs> but to echo the other panelists, um, I think developing markets saw much less of an impact, and our channel portfolio is really focused on developing markets. So actually, and the fact we don't have really any advertising, uh, we were really the lucky beneficiary, I think. And of course, when it comes to pay TV channels, marketing, distribution, positioning on, on an EPG, and so forth uh, are, are all crucial, but I, I would guess there would be a consensus that, that really the cornerstone is content and programming. Last year was uh, very interesting in, in, in several ways. Um, there, were, there, was there were global launches of certain shows. We were seeing um, pay TV channel operators invest at an international level. Um, Roma, can, can I perhaps come to you and ask, uh, with Haven, for example, 
how, as an international group, you approached acquiring content that would roll out across, across the channels? You know, I think this is actually one of the most exciting changes of, uh, in the global pay television market that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years, certainly for the channels that have dramatic programming and scripted programming, is that the pay television groups internationally are getting to a size and scale where they can afford to invest in original content and new dramatic production. And at the same time, the business models here in the U.S. and around the world for production are changing. They're becoming more stressed in terms of deficit financing. And these two things came together at the same time. And for us, it was something we wanted to take advantage of. And I know um, Fox and other groups have done the same thing. So what we did with, with our channel group, we're at 71 channels, so uh, smaller than some of our competitors, but finally at the scale where we could take a piece of production, a programming money from each territory, pool it together, and then invest that into an original program. So we actually had uh, a number of shows. Haven on Sci-Fi, which is the first global Sci-Fi production. It's on every Sci-Fi channel in the world in a first window, including here in the US. Rookie Blue, which was a partnership with ABC here in the US that premiered on our channels, uh, most of our channels around the world, um, which is a crime procedural. We've done a non-scripted for Sci-Fi Channel. We've got uh, Fairly Legal with USA Channel here, and then a show called Shattered with Can West Global up in, in Canada. And that's compared to two years ago where we had no original production, zero. So zero to five in a very short period of time. And it's really just about um, leveraging the scale and the breadth of our business globally and leveraging the willingness of independent producers to think creatively about how they put together their production financing, how they put together the distribution, and it's really worked for us. And, and, and Roma, to, to clarify, are, are these shows, should we think about these as co-productions or global acquisitions? I mean, did you, did you come in and fund, uh, you know, fill a funding gap? Did you deficit finance these, these shows? I, I wonder what the model is. I, I think it's all of the above, and, and certainly Fox has done a number of these shows as well, and Renan can talk to the model that they've done on hits like Walking Dead. Um, what we've done is twofold. We either come in as a, a pre-buy, so an acquisition, um, for all of our territories, or as many as our territories as we can cover around the world. Um, that's one model. The other model is that we come in as a co-producer, which means we have a participation in the back end, we're putting a bit more money in up front, and we have a voice at the table from a creative perspective and can guide the show from a creative perspective to make sure it works for our channels globally. The next model from that is that we also can take distribution rights globally, so you pay even more, which becomes a distribution advance. And um, I, I believe that's what Fox did on Walking Dead, which was something that we're now looking at as well. And, and Hernan, the, the Walking Dead, um, the, the numbers were, were fantastic. It did brilliantly on AMC here, and I know <coughs> Internationally, it was, uh, it was a really interesting example in that it was launched globally. Um, I, I guess the question is, what, what were the key learning points from, from that? I mean, why launch it globally? Would, you know, was that a success? Can you perhaps talk, talk us through that? Of course. We, we had uh, done a couple of semi-global or multi-territorial launches of uh, shows that we had commissioned or acquired. Um, as a group, uh, Listener and Mental were prior to The Walking Dead. But in The Walking Dead, we saw all the makings of a show that it wasn't an obvious choice. A lot of uh, networks had the opportunity to uh, bid on, on The Walking Dead, and uh, not everybody saw the potential on the show, and not everybody saw past the zombies. To be honest, if I had a dime for each time I heard the expression, this show is about zombies, and zombies are not as sexy as have vampires. I would probably make a, a billion and a half dollars in revenue. But the, um, the, the, the powerful thing about The Walking Dead, and we cannot take any credit for the creative process that goes to uh, the AMC team, and, and if you guys are interested in, in, in particular, I recommend the uh, session by Gail and her the, this afternoon, the executive producer of the show, who will talk to how a, a show like that became a reality. We thought uh, that the power of launching the show around Halloween and creating this global stand where uh, we had zombies all around uh, the world come out and invade the cities uh, would create uh, a buzz on, online on Twitter and on Facebook that ultimately will uh, leverage the uh, power of, of the brand in each of these markets. And that combined with a marketing push that we put behind the show that is parallel to only our other major shows, such as Lee. Um, I think both things in conjunction, plus the fact that it happened to be a really good show, 
made the success that is. Would we love to replicate it? Yes, but do we think we can win the lottery twice? Maybe not, but we'll surely try. With, with, with having, having a, an international global launch, I mean, does, does a viewer watching in the UK really care that this show is launching in seven, 15, 20, 100 territories elsewhere. I mean, does it just allow you to kind of coordinate your marketing efforts more effectively, or is it about mitigating the effects of piracy, I wonder? It's all of that, but I think they do care. Actually, whenever you, you have a property that you put it on the status where consumers around the world are uniformly heard, hearing the message that this is such an important uh, product for our channel that it's worth watching, they'll come and watch. And we didn't invent the model, the movie studios did. And uh, we weren't even the first ones to do uh, um, a very close day and date release. Disney did it with Lost for the finale. And, and what we've seen um, is that viewers are paying attention to these highly complex, very character driven, and in many cases serialized shows, and they do want to see them close to the US date. Now, I think they're going to be more the exception than the rule because we, had a lot of manpower and a lot of creative power um, behind The Walking Dead that we cannot probably replicate for every single show, but we surely can do it for four or five shows at a year. Thanks. Andy, for, for, the, for the Sony uh, networks, ha have you done that kind of global release? Is it something that, that informs your th thinking? I, of course, you would have seen The Walking Dead and other examples. Uh, we haven't yet. We're actually about to, you know, announce something sort of really following the, the model and the sec success that, that these guys have had. What we've done up to date in terms of original production has been more regionalized and really more in the format area. For example, you know, we've done a number of seasons of a local version of Amazing Race in Asia, which had a lot of power and success and pulled a lot of ratings for us and, and was launched similarly but across a region. Not, not globally, but we're, we're, we're going down the, the same sort of road with a, a couple of, of projects and, and debating internally exactly this issue right now. Do you, do you get the benefit and the power of a global launch? Do they, do they care uh, you know, in one place versus the other? Or do you still m maintain more of a local relationship to not only just the content, but the marketing? So for us, jury's, jury's out on it because we're just starting to dabble in it, but it's, it's, it's really interesting to watch what these guys have done and, and, and see what the learnings are because it is all pretty new for all of us to, to kind of be in these kinds of businesses compared to you know, the, the usual history. Sure. Simon, I, 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 was in, um, I was in Romania earlier this year and I, I saw the, um, <coughs> for the launch of the local version of In Treatment. That, mm -hmm. That's a really interesting example. I know that's a show that started out in Israel, was a big hit on HBO in the US and is now being remade throughout some of the Central and uh, Eastern European territories. Can we expect to see, well, one, what was the thinking there? Has it been a success? Can we expect to see more of the big shows on the US network be localized in that way? Um, so let me give maybe an answer to, to the earlier question. And I think we're a bit more skeptical about this global production, global release idea, because at its heart, HBO has to be an alternative an alternative to the commercial broadcasters and an alternative to the public broadcasters in each of the countries in which we operate. And that uh, inherently leads to a very different programming model in each of the countries. So um, we do do programming internationally, but they are very specific to the countries. So for example, if you take a show like Epitaphios, which was very successful in Latin America, it's not just a Latin American show, it's a very Argentinian show. And, and the same is true for Indoriva, which you mentioned in, in Romania. So we look at what each of the countries want and then work out an original programming strategy around that. And it just so happens that we felt in Central Europe there was an interest in therapy. Uh, it, was, it was a good show for Romania and it'll also, we think, be a good show for Poland. But we're not taking a model of saying, let's look at all the US shows we have and make local versions of them. It's kind of almost the reverse. We want to see what works locally. And if that's a format of a show, whether it be an HBO show or a show from another network internationally, we'll do that. Or we'll do an original show uh, for each of those markets. And, and Simon, but perhaps this is a, as a, a dumb question, but why, why even invest in local content? HBO is kind of a you know, calling card for high-end, glossy, enormous budget drama. Um, I want to see that in the UK. Uh, people all over want to see that. What, why do you need to complement that with local content? And also, how sharp, you know, what, what is the return in the business um, sense? 
well, to my earlier point about being an alternative to commercial broadcasters, we do local programming, we do original programming where we feel it's important as part of the offering. And of course, we continually assess it, and our assessment at the moment is that it works very well for us. And in fact, um, in each of the markets in which we operate, we are substantially stepping up the amount of original programming we do. So generally, the HBO or Cinemax channels will offer uh, movies, uh, the US original programming, and then their own local original programming as well. And we find it does really uh, pay a return because uh, we've seen a pretty substantial increase in subscriber base. Is, the, is there, with, when you have a big locally originated show, is there an immediate kind of uptick in subscribers, or is it that clear, or is it? Well, this is a, a, an age-old question that applies just not internationally, but domestically as well. And it's not any one show. You can't really point to any one show. It's the combination. It's the combination of all the programming, whether it be uh, the sports on some of the networks, whether it be the movies, whether it be the various original shows. So we do do a lot of research, and it's the combination of the various offerings, provided that they are distinct uh, and different enough from what else is out there that uh, causes people to subscribe. And, and D, it's, uh, it's an interesting time um, for discovery in, in terms of the international rollout of TLC. I wonder, when, when you're launching a network, what part kind of lo locally originated programming plays? Is, is that something that comes later, or does it inform your thinking from, from the get-go? Well, I think with TLC, it's, it's a very different model to a discovery in the sure. sense that discovery being nonfiction. Um, I think the content travels globally, and in fact, on Discovery, probably 90% of the content is actually shared globally, um, and probably in the majority does work globally. When you're talking about entertainment and lifestyle, there's the, the, um, the plan is still to have a lot of shared content, but supplemented with more local, because again, the, I guess the nuances and the lifestyles and the, what people need locally on lifestyle entertainment is quite different. So for example, um, we launched, the first international launch for TLC was in Norway last year. Um, we began with shows that hadn't been seen there before, but they were global shows like LA Inc. and Kat Von D, for example, went to the launch, and again, that really helped generate a lot of press with consumers and affiliates. What we're now going to do is launch our first local production there, Don't Tell the Bride, um, at the end of March. And this will begin the, the local formats, if you like, for this um, category, because, you know, as I say, across whether it's, you know, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Latam or Asia, tastes are very different in the lifestyle entertainment genre, which many of you will be very familiar with. So we are certainly looking at a, a different model for TLC. It'll be, as I say, global content supplemented with more local to really drive PR consumer interest and, and get that local flavor, which is very important for that genre. And, and I wondered, the, um, in terms of working with producers in, in order to get hold of the very best content for TLC, uh, Discovery has sometimes had, had a reputation for wanting to retain all rights, which can put producers off, I wonder. Um, I, sorry, it can put producers off in some instances. W will there be more flexibility, perhaps, when you're um, programming TLC in that respect? Yeah. I think the answer is we've got to be open to all new forms um, of of financing and of models, and we've, we're talking with a wide range of production companies for TLC and for discovery in local markets as well. And I think there is a general awareness um, and, a, and, a, and a, a feeling that we do want to get the best ideas, mm. and therefore we have to work the economic models that will get that. Um, you know, the best ideas will command, um, obviously, higher prices, but we've got to be prepared to do that. So I think the models are changing, and we have to change accordingly. Um, and it's something we've been doing a lot of talking to with the production communities around the world. And then uh, the, also in terms of new channels, uh, of course, in, in the US, the Oprah-owned uh, network has recently rolled out, and, and the Hub also, both, uh, both joint ventures, of course. I wonder, m might we see those launch internationally, or, or would it be more a case of seeing that programming launch internationally? I think it's probably too early to say for both of those yet, but I think what it has to do is it's got to make sense for the markets locally. You know, the Hub and OWN make you know, fantastic channels here in the US and made sense from a, a financial point of view and a, and a uh, viewer point of view. You look at the kids model, you know, it's a very competitive marketplace. Um, Discovery Kids is here in Latin, in Latin America, for example. So I think it's got to be, does it make sense for the, the local market? And then on a regional basis, and if that isn't the case, is there an opportunity to take the programming and have it on other channels? So we may not perhaps launch um, um, the Oprah Network everywhere, but we may take some of the content. So it's very much early stages of development on, on that one right now, but certainly I think the content is looking very strong, um, and we would hope to see it across the world in, in some way. 
Some short Simon, can I ask you a, a question about the role of uh, movies on, on your channels? Because, of course, in the past, they would have been <coughs> largely programmed with movies along with original content and, and so forth. But I'm thinking with the ubiquity of movies now, whether actually original series offer more potential to build uh, marketing messages and, and buzz. Well, let's be clear. Movies will always be at the core of the HBO offering. About 70% of our schedule around the world is, is theatrical movies. Um, but to your point, uh, channel success is driven, it's, it's pretty simple, channel success is driven by compelling and exclusive content. And um, I do sometimes have a concern when uh, uh, I go to my local supermarket and I see the Redbox machine and I can rent Social Network or Inception for a dollar, and yet if I want to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, it's four dollars, that the, the movie is being priced at a quarter of the cost of a cup of coffee, and that's before it comes to an HBO network. So I, I do worry that pricing has got a little out of whack in the marketplace and that people don't view movies as, as importantly as they used to in the past. When I, when I first came to America 25 years ago uh, and I saw HBO, I was really stunned and amazed by the, the recency and the, the quality of the theatrical features on HBO. And, and I do worry that that's not as true as it was before. Um, so I think we need to, to, to work on that with our partners. But um, movies will always be at the core of, uh, of the offering of our premium channels. And Simon, can, can I also ask, obviously you oversee the international channels and also the content syndication program sales. Yep. I wonder how you balance one against the other. I'm thinking, of course, of the, the recent, the huge deal that was done with B Sky B in the UK where there was an output deal which effectively allowed Sky to launch Sky Atlantic which is 90% or very, very largely programmed with, with HBO. Why do that deal and not launch an HBO channel, for example? Uh, because the check was very attractive. <laughs> um, it's something we an analyze in each market. We always think about it. Uh, we do a lot of analysis on it. And in this case, that's, uh, that, that's, that's what made sense. Um, there's nothing like the negotiation between one arm of HBO and another arm of HBO. So when we're selling our own programming to our channels, that's probably like all the companies, that's always the most contentious. But uh, we, we do uh, make a pretty careful calculation in each territory. Uh, to, to Hernan, to Simon's point about working with different divisions within the same company, of course, uh, the parent group, News Corporation, owns pay TV platforms the world over. So uh, I guess you're guaranteed carriage on, on those and good slots <laughs> in the EPG. Not necessarily, actually. If you were applying the wall in the conversations we just had with Sky to move from uh, the position of, that we were in what, what's called as Skyberia all the way up to page three on DPG, it was an arm's length uh, discussion with lawyers involved and regulatory concerns, and, and we actually had to compete with other uh, networks that are also moving up. And uh, I think when um, you can make a stronger case that in Italy we have a position that we wouldn't have had uh, had in, uh, Sky been the, the main platform in the territory. But what sometimes some time is made is, is that when we came to the Italian market, Sky Italy needed to uh, teach people, uh, teach households that there was a reason to buy television other than stealing. And that reason wasn't just movies and sports, it was also entertainment channels, as it is everywhere else in the world. So we, because they were really busy operating the, the satellite platform and running the movie channels and running the sports channels, we told them, we'll take the basic channel problem off your hands, we'll create a bundle of really compelling um, cable channels or satellite channels that today still are the highest rated component of the overall uh, package right after sports. And, uh, and it's worked for, uh, for both parties. Now, um, News Corp doesn't have as strong a position in platforms everywhere else in the world, and, and I think you can point to our small uh, um, uh, time when we owned DirecTV in the US to see that there was no uh, significant before and after uh, makeup of, of the domestic cable network group as a result of News Corp owning DirecTV. Thanks. Um, one of the things that, that we were asked to address on the panel was, was building the brand as well. Um, I'm curious, as given that a lot of the, the panelists' uh, channel operations are effectively, you know, there's the News Corp relationship with Sony, um, there's, there's a studio relationship in many cases. Andy, perhaps can, can I come to you? 
how does that inform your thinking in terms of branding of channels? I know you have Sony Entertainment, but then some of your biggest brands, AXN um, and so forth, don't actually carry the Sony brand. Why would you not want to leverage that? Um, I, I think it's, it's an evolutionary answer. Sony's owned, uh, owned our studio for 20 years, and when they came in, they were an electronics company, and they weren't really in in the broadcast business, and I think there were a lot of questions about the use of the Sony brand, one of the most powerful and recognized brands in the world to the consumers, and what the effects might be of, of using that brand in other parts of the business, whether it was in the music business or the, you know, the television business or, and, and, and so forth. So we started slowly. We started in Latin America and we started in India. Um, just sort of, I guess you'd say, getting used to the idea. Now, the Sony brand in Latin America and the Sony channels there, as well as in India, India have become kind of so powerful and so known to the consumers that I think it became very clear to Sony that there was a real uh, uh, cross-pollinization and synergy uh, f for consumers, especially in, in emerging markets that Sony wasn't as established in. And so. It's been argued that the Sony brand associated with our channels in Latin America and India had a tremendous effect, a positive effect, in helping the electronics business grow in those business because when we started 15 years ago, the electronics business wasn't, wasn't very prevalent. On the other side, in other markets, like where we established AXN first in Latin America and, and Asia and so forth, uh, it, was just a, it was just a different uh, a di different direction. It was about uh, establishing the brand as an independent brand. I think we used a lot of uh, clever ways of, of associating it with Sony and letting the consumer know without being blatantly saying it's a Sony AXN channel. 20 years later now, we're constantly thinking about it and we're constantly using uh, the umbrella and the strength of the Sony brand in markets where where it matters. So again, in, in Latin America, you'll see a lot stronger association with Sony and the umbrella brand with some of our other channels. And then there are other markets in Europe where it doesn't mean quite as much, and so we're a little bit more careful about it. So long answer to your question, but it's, it's, it's very evolutionary, and it's a very local, market by market, region by region decision. Thanks. And then, Roma, I know this is something you, you've addressed um, in your time at NBC Universal, and I think now the, all of the core channels carry the Universal brand. Tell us why that's the case, why you made that change. You know, I, th I think at the end of the day, and the thing that connects all of this conversation is that we all have to do the best we can with what we've got. It's, it's a big world out there, no matter how big a company you are. It, when, when, you, when we look at ourselves globally, and you know, we'll be bigger this Friday, you're, we're still a small company internationally, and it's about leveraging the strength you have, be that a studio, be that a platform, um, you know, be that a, a fantastic brand and output of content from, from the US market. So we're always looking as, as a group that considers ourselves very entrepreneurial, how can we grow? How can we find an advantage? How can we move a little faster, skip a couple of steps and get, get a little bit farther ahead? So, when, when I looked at the brand portfolio, and we had a variety of different brands in there, the one thing that we didn't have in there was the name Universal. And Universal, so it's by its very nature, is a, is a very big word and a powerful word. So we actually went out and did market research in the local markets and said, what does this name mean to people? Uh, does it mean something to people in different parts of the world in different languages? What does it mean, and is that helpful to us? And what came back to us was very, very powerful that the, the name Universal was ubiquitous. You could ask someone in Korea, you could ask someone in England, you could ask someone in Canada, you could ask someone in, in Russia, and they knew Universal from that first second of the movies, right? The big globe that comes up. And that when they thought about that, what they thought was what was coming next was really great Hollywood-based entertainment, really great scripted entertainment, which is what our channels are about. Now, could we make the connection to TV was the next challenge where we asked them, would you watch a TV channel because it had this name more so than the next channel? And the answer was simply yes. And then in a world of 200, 300 channels, multiple outlets of choice on multiple platforms, people gravitate to the things that they know and understand first. And when they see Universal, it means something to them, so they go to it. And that was our decision, and we added it in as a, in, in a different level 
to all of our brands globally. And as we rebranded our portfolio, two things happened. One, our audience numbers went up in almost every country that we rebranded in. And two, the phone started ringing from the platforms. And in the world of international television, the platforms drive our business, so the satellite and cable and IPTV platforms. And they started calling wanting universal, because for them, they needed to create a package that was compelling and set them apart from their com customers, and they wanted to be associated with the big Hollywood companies. So even if the connection <coughs> wasn't there with the consumer, the connection was there with the platform. And, and it became a no-brainer that why hadn't we done this before? Let's just get on with it. Bruma, do you think that um, in terms of branding, do you think there's any consumer, viewer loyalty to those particular brands, or do you think actually people at home are lo more loyal to Haven, Rookie Blue, the, the, shows, the shows themselves, I wonder? Well, I, th I personally believe that that's one of the great advantages of, of pay television or specialty television or cable television, whatever we want to call it, is that it's very brand focused. Because we're, we're by our nature speaking to a narrower audience, a more targeted niche audience, delivering a more specific genre-related often type of content, the relationship um, becomes, a, when I worked in Canada, someone I worked for there used to say show versus flow. Do you come for the show or do you come for the flow of the channel? And I think in the world of pay television, when you do your job right, the shows bring people in. That becomes your, your marketing. But the flow is what keeps them there. And that because our channels tend to be a second choice, that in most markets we're in, they're going first to the free television channels. They're going for those big dramas, the local dramas, the US dramas. What are they going to second? I want them to say, well, let me go see what's on sci-fi. Let me go see what's on Studio Universal. Let me go see what's on uh, Diva Universal. And if, if they say that, then to me, that's the power of the brand and our relationship with them. And we're seeing that grow as, as we grow. Um, we're running fairly short of time. I've got one quick last question that I'd like uh, to, to put to each of the panelists. Then we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, Robert, let, let's stick with you. The question that I wanted to ask everyone was, what are the main goals? How will your business look different in 12 months' time? And I think that's a particularly interesting one, uh, one for you. And I know I've asked you the question you ask several on times Monday? before, but um, <laughs> I, I think things have changed in, in the week since I last asked you. So uh, sitting here in, in 12 months, how, how will the business look different? Uh, you know, as they say, plus ça change. I, I, I think that 12 months from now, um, I, I hope that our business continues on the growth path that, it, that it's continuing on with uh, the partnership and, and combination of the Comcast International Group um, run by Kevin McClellan, who's here, and, and our group. We actually don't get that much bigger, <laughs> We're, but I think we get smarter, and I think we will get stronger into the brand universe, which will be very powerful. So I, I hope that 12 months from now, we're just um, doing more original content. Our brands are getting stronger. We are coordinating across our own business and our other arms of our business across uh, the new NBC Universal in a stronger and stronger way. What I think is really interesting is five to 10 years from now, which is, it's all gonna look completely different, but I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Hernan, it was, a, it was a good year for the, the, the Fox International channels. Uh, how do you build on that this year? Last year was a good year. We, we're actually uh, very um, optimistic about the, the years ahead, and, and 12 months is not really a, a, um, a long time to, to make a significant change. But if I had to guess, I, I would say that our portfolio is already present in each of the countries where we want to be, and we're in each of the content segments where we like to be. We're in entertainment, we're in factual, and we have a small position in, in uh, lifestyle and sports. So I think the next uh, few months will be about uh, fine tuning those portfolios in each of those brand groups and in each of those markets and making sure that in every market where we are, we have a position where we can see eye to eye with the cable or satellite operator and we can get come renewal time what we think our channels are worth. Thanks. Andy, for, for the Sony channels, what's, uh, what, what are the major objectives this year? We're hoping to acquire The Simpsons, and um, <laughs> then we, we sorry. We, no. In the absence of that, uh, you know, I, I think that's what the guy said. I mean, 12 months is a is a pretty short uh, time period. We're, you know, continuing to grow organically. Um, I think we'll do do a few interesting things in the original programming world. I think we'll do a few interesting things in the digital world. I think we'll 
launch a handful of new channels in certain regions and sort of just keep doing what, what we're doing. You know, we're, we're sort of about hitting singles and doubles and, and slow and steady, winning the race, not, not, uh, not doing anything sort of uh, outlandish or extraordinary. And uh, it seems to be working, I think, for all of us. And so uh, I hope it continues for, for many years to come. And, and D, I wonder if we're, we're sitting here at the same time next year, um, how will the rollout of TLC progress? Yeah, well, I think we're really hoping that we'll hit 75 markets by the end of this year, and that will be 100 million subscribers, so that's our ambition. And, um, you know, fingers crossed we're on the way to get there. Um, you know, on top of that, I think, you know, international is a real priority for discovery. And, you know, I think we, the TLC part is a very big part of that. Um, that will see more local production coming on board and us trying new formats and trying things a little bit differently. I think in the commercial sense, you know, we've seen um, some deregulation in the UK around product placement. You know, we're excited about that and see what that can do from a programming point of view. Um, and will it bring some new opportunities to the table? But certainly, you know, like everybody here, we're optimistic about the year ahead. Um, we're doing a lot of work in the 3D area at the moment. Uh, might, might there be uh, uh, international 3D channels? Well, I think, you know, let's, let's wait and see. You know, 3D is certainly something that we're very involved in. In fact, we're partnering with, um, with Sony, with Andy, um, here in the US in a network. Um, will we have full-blown networks across the world? You know, let's wait and see. Um, the model is very different from HD, but I think what we're seeing it as a real differentiator for the business and, and for our platform um, partners. So, and again, the consumers seem to be liking it with the uptake in the UK ahead of expectations this Christmas. So, you know, a lot of, again, I would see us, you know, really pushing ahead on that one as it left with HD, but a very different model in the sense that we're learning as we go. Sure. Um, Simon, I, I know HBO Go has recently launched internationally and, and you guys have been speaking about that for a while. Is, is that kind of top of mind th this year, launching that in the international territories? Yes, I was <coughs> going to say, I'm just going to repeat what Andy said but without the Simpsons. But um, <laughs> I should add, the uh, yes, we are looking to roll out HBO Go. It's launched in Poland. Uh, we will, by the end of the year, have announced a, a number of launches in, in countries. So that will enable people who are subscribers to our network to view programming uh, on their uh, PC or, or iPad or, or uh, any mobile phone. Good stuff, thank you. Um, we've got two minutes, so we've got time for a, a couple of questions, perhaps. If anyone wants to come up to the mic. If you could just say, uh, say your name and where you're from, please. Which company? Hello. Hi, I'm Bernie from California. Um, uh, which which company, about, uh, sorry. How are you guys dealing with cord cutting uh, as more and more consumers kind of consume more content? I know that Simon just talked about HBO Go, but I kind of wanted to hear from all of you how the uh, market will change, especially internationally, because as we're uh, observing in the US, we see a lot more cord cutting just because of the news reporting about wondering how the markets are shifted uh, internationally based on that. Actually, I'll take it. I mean, the, the concerns about cord cutting uh, just came from an investor conference uh, two weeks ago, have subsided. And, um, and no, uh, no companies have reported fourth quarter um, subscriber numbers yet. But the anecdotal evidence that, that we've seen uh, suggests that the uh, negative trend that there was in the first couple of quarters is, is over. More and more uh, people were concerned that consumers would cut the cord and move to online consumption of video as a substitute for uh, the cable bill. But the more you look at the actual numbers, you saw that the people that were cutting um, cable and satellite were actually people that couldn't afford it altogether and therefore didn't have online either. And um, as at the end of the day, 95% uh, of our um, television consumption or our consumption of, of media uh, happens in, in front of the television set. And it's uh, cable television and, and satellite television is such a deeply ingrained product in, 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 in our uh, daily um, habits that over the long run, uh, people are going to my prediction is continue to get most of their television through a subscription, be it in any technological way that, that it may become. And I think the challenge for that is really about us as an industry continuing to evolve and, and being innovative. And you see the cable and satellite companies and the IPTV companies offering more and more services. That, that becomes a value, and I, I agree with Hernan. People will continue paying for it, but it's got to evolve. And that's the TV Anywhere idea and the, the various services through, through different platforms you see what um, is happening with B Sky B in the UK and their, their HD numbers have driven phenomenal growth for them in terms of subscribers over the last couple of years. 
because it's getting better and better. So it's about creating value for the customer. And I think as an industry and as content providers, if we continue to look across multiple platforms and working with the, uh, the platforms to deliver to the audience, it's, you may not have a cord, but you'll still have a subscription. So. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank you. We're, we're running over, but perhaps time for a very, very quick one. Uh, over here. Uh, Kate Bulkley, I'm a journalist. You talked earlier about global launches of programs and how that's like a really cool thing for a lot of your networks. And yet I didn't hear anything about how you might simultaneously do something on other platforms. Is that because the platform operators that you work with internationally say, no, 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 don't put it out on, don't put it out on new media. We just want it on our, on our systems, on our cable or satellite systems. Or is that something you're going to start thinking about when you do a global launch of a, of a show? I, I think one of the reasons why we got behind the strategy of launching a show globally is precisely because we want consumers to very strongly associate the brand with the Fox channels. They're not everywhere globally. We, we call it a global uh, launch because it's in our territories on our channels. But um, the, it, it's no different whether um, it's, it's a global commission or a locally acquired show. One of the things that we bring to the platforms is the guarantee that the subscribers are going to see a significant amount of quality content on our channels first, whether that content is produced by us, licensed from 20th Century Fox, or uh, produced uh, um, jointly with AMC, it's something that's uh, secondary. And, um, and, and I think that's not going to, to, to change. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time. In fact, we're, we're running over. So. Um, Thank you to the panelists. I think in terms of talking about international channels, the, the lineup couldn't have been better, and we've had some, some great insights. So uh, please join me in saying thank you to the panel. Thank you.